Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us on a Friday and a sunny Friday at that, a rare occurrence in Irvine these days. Um, I am so delighted. My name is Stacey Branham, by the way. I'm an associate professor of informatics, and I'm so delighted to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Kristen Shinohara, who's joining us from the Rochester Institute of Technology um, and their School of Information. Um, so Kristen's an expert on accessible computing and has been doing work on not only how to make technology accessible to people with disabilities, but also how to make higher education accessible to especially graduate students with disabilities. Um, her work has been really inspirational to mine. When I first joined this field back in 2014, I was doing a postdoc, and my very first two papers were all about how people who are blind work with others who are sighted and blind um, in various settings, and how that social setting is really consequential to the way we should think about technology design. Um, and little did I know that Kristen had already been um, uh, creating the conversation around this with her notion of design for social accessibility, about how we can design from the very beginning technologies that integrate and include people with disabilities instead of separating them and excluding them. Um, so uh, I've recently learned that Kristen is now an associate professor with tenure at RIT. Um, and so our field is so happy, and I'm sure your university is so happy to be able to retain your talent um, and all the contributions you make. And uh, we are certainly happy to have you here today. So please come on up and share your work with us. And welcome, Dr. Sheena Hara. Thank Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Well, thank you so much, Stacey. That was a very wonderful introduction. I feel so undeserving. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm so glad to be here um, and to be able to share my talk with you. Um, I've had a lot of really wonderful conversations today. And so I kind of feel like I'll be like, preaching to the choir a little bit. Um, so I hope that you'll bear with me uh, through my presentation today. And I just want to make sure I have a clock on how long I talk. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about disability and accessibility in computing education. It's a little kind of a broad thing. And I wanted to start out today with a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, and I just want to ask you to think of a software engineer or a software developer that you know. And it could be someone you know personally, um, or it could just be someone that you know of or just like the general idea or notion of who a software engineer or a software developer is. Um, and while you're thinking of that person, I just wanted to bring your attention to the background uh, image on my slide, which is the Google image results for searching for a software engineer. And you may notice that it's heavily male or men that are on this slide. There are people of color, which is really nice. There's not a lot of women. There are other images of code things like that. So just a little bit of a taste of some ideas of software engineers. So just to kind of put our answers to our mind, like who was it that you thought of? And uh, you don't have to say it out loud, you can keep it to yourself. And just think for a minute about this person. Um, what knowledge and skills do they have to do that job? Um, what do they need to be able to do that job? Um, you know, what is it that they're operating within in their day-to-day -day activities? So to kind of come full circle with the background picture, the image here is of a image Google, Google image search result for the hashtag, uh, uh, I look like an engineer, which was a little bit of a response to the first slide that had mostly men on the slide, right? And so on this slide, we have more women and they're holding up signs with that hashtag. Um, we also do have people of color and we also do have men. So it's a little bit more of a diverse group. And I just wanna pause and hold this thought in our mind about what we're thinking about when we're thinking about software engineers and software developers. I also just wanna take a small note and say, I'm not specifically targeting software engineers or software developers. I'm just thinking about tech professionals in general, um, but this gives us a little, something a little more concrete to think about when we think about a person and what it is that they're doing. So what is it that they're doing? Well, they are focusing on next generation technology and it really involves a lot of complex thinking and creativity. These are screenshots of some of the newsy things that have been coming up over the last year or so um, from the Verge website. You're all probably familiar with that. Um, and so we have a lot of things about like VR technologies or smart home stuff. 
Drones is a really popular thing. And of course, nobody can escape all the headlines about AI in the last nine months or so. So these are all just a taste of some of the things that are on the horizon when it comes to tech. Um, and obviously there's a lot of complicated stuff happening around all of these technologies. When we're thinking about those engineers and developers and what it is that they're doing, we come back to where they learn those skills and that knowledge that they brought to their job. And that brings us to computing education. Um, there's a current rewrite of the uh, suggested curriculum for computer science education that is being led by the ACM, IEEE, and AAAI groups. Um, and this is part of their mission, which is to produce professionals with competency um, in using computing to systematically solve problems. So their goal is to train these individuals to be professionals to attach to attack some of those problems in that slide that I showed previously. So let's think about these problems, right? We're talking about specific problems. What are those problems? If we place them in context of these news articles today, we could probably slice away some aspect of the problems that we see on these images. We have like this image of someone trying to take a picture of the drones and also the way that they're arranged in the sky. We have this idea that VR is still too expensive. So for somebody, it costs too much money to get. Um, which probably includes myself. Um, there's also this idea of a smart home and what that entails and working and living around the home and what it is you're doing and what makes it smart and how do you live and work with that. And then of course we can't even scratch the surface about all of the human problems that we've been hearing about since um, ChatGPT came on the scene uh, less than a year ago um, and everything that's propagated since. So one thing that I notice when I look at all of these headlines is that really all of these problems revolve around humans and what it is they're doing. The VR technology costs money to create, but I mean, it's about the money that we are willing to spend on it that has something to do with whether or not it's expensive. This is a very human aspect of it. And the smart home is you know, where we're living and how we're gonna in interact with all of these technologies. So obviously there's a strong connection between all of these tech and the, human, uh, the influence and the daily life that we're, uh, that we're experiencing every day. I don't really have to tell anyone in this room that human-centered interactions are like the most unpredictable and messy things ever. And so if we're talking about building technologies and we're saying, oh yeah, also they're human problems, problem solved, that really doesn't get us very far. Humans are really messy, we're very chaotic and we're all very different. We vary in behavior in, in the performance and how we do things. In HCI, we kind of have some ways of trying to attack this problem of working with humans to build, build the technologies that we want to use. So we have this design cycle or process, however you want to call it. Um, and often this involves integrating humans at some aspect of that process so that we're asking them what to build or we're evaluating our systems with them just to make sure that they can use it. This process is so important that it's actually an international standard. So it's something that the world has decided that this is something we should be including in the work that we do whenever we build technologies. I think this is one of the layouts of that process there. And it's generally the same idea. It's just not as pretty as my little diagram there. <laughs> um, so one of the important aspects of this process though is that it sort of embeds and assumes that this cycle will take some of the messiness and the chaos of being human into consideration when developing the next iteration of that cycle, right? That's part of the plan is we're gonna try to harness um, all of that unpredictability. And actually, yes, human experiences are very diverse um, and they are all over the board. And if we can harness it, um, then it would actually improve technology design, right? This is also a common sort of mantra about usability, which is that if we can get diverse users to help us evaluate our technology, then the usability will improve. This is sort of the general notion of that. One good example of this actually is this idea of diverse user experiences when it comes to accessibility, and more specifically, the diverse user experiences of people with disabilities. To kind of go into a little bit of history about this, right? a lot of the technical innovations that we are even used to today came about because someone with a disability saw a problem and used their inventiveness to figure out a solution. So many, uh, all of the items here in this list were um, had contributions from people with disabilities who made that technology come about. Things like closed captioning or text messaging, text messaging 
um, OCR, and even the electric toothbrush. Someone with a disability had a problem with something, encountered a challenge, and decided that this is something I need to solve. I can create a technology. Here's the solution. And these are things that we use every day, whether we have a disability or not. So I kind of threw in accessibility there in my little intro, and I just want to take a little bit of an explanatory comma to talk a bit about what I mean when I say accessibility, um, because I think this definition varies for different uh, groups. When I think about accessibility, I think about the means by which a person with a disability is using a technology. So one example here is in this image, there's a woman who's sitting at a MacBook laptop. She's got sunglasses on, she's blind, and she's got a headphone in her ear. She is completely blind. So the visual on the screen that would tell her what's going on with the computer is something she doesn't have access to. She can't access that visual information. Um, the headphone plugged into the laptop gives her access to the voice over screen reader that's built into the Apple product that allows her to then navigate and use that computer. So the voice over screen reader is the means by which she can use that technology. It's giving her access to it. So if we come back to this, ISO standard or basically this notion of design, we kind of are building this assumption of how we want to include diverse user experiences by notion of having this cycle that allows us to bring humans into it, learn a little bit about them, and then create technologies that will take into consideration those experiences. However, I would argue that this might always not work the way we would like to, even though we have really great examples of people with disabilities creating innovative technologies and the notion that we should be including them um, amongst all of our other users and our technology design. So one example might be, who comes to mind when you think about who is a software engineer or who is a software developer? And I will say that probably a lot of people in this room might have thought of someone with a disability, um, but oftentimes I'm gonna guess that probably not. Um, a lot of times people don't actually assume that a person with a disability um, would be a software engineer or a software developer or any tech professional that you can think of. So I would say that these assumptions are actually embedded into our practices and how we built our cycles. That cycle about the human-centered design process assumes we might take into consideration disability, but that's not always the case because we aren't quite there yet in our mindset. And it would be a good question to ask ourselves, how many software engineers do we know who has a disability? And I would also put aside the caveat that you know, we may not know everybody's disability, some are invisible um, and that's okay too. Um, but just as a general level of awareness, do we know of a lot of people with disabilities who are in tech? If we're a student, do we have other students in our classes that we know of? Have we observed disability in classes? If we're instructors, have we worked with students with disabilities either in our classes or as our advisees and students we're mentoring? Off, more often than not, it's actually a very low number of incidents that we know about. So I would argue that all, um, we actually need to include more people with disabilities in tech in general. And I wanna be more specific about that. I'm talking about as software engineers, yes, but also as developers and designers, and then of course, as users. Traditionally, they're usually considered um, in tech at the user stage, but not at the other stages. The other aspect about this that I um, wanna think about is that we also need to include accessibility in computing education when we teach computing or informatics broadly um, to think about accessibility as part of the way that we do things so that we raise awareness for our non-disabled peers as well as bring um, accessibility into the courses so that students with disabilities feel welcome in those spaces. So to kind of counter against this, I just wanna throw out a brief argument that I get a lot of whenever I say things like this, which is there aren't a lot of people with disabilities. I've talked to countless people in industry, and this is pretty much everything they always say to me every time I tell them what I just told you, right? Um, and this is their argument in saying, we have millions of customers and X percent of them may have a disability and we have to focus on the largest group that will give us revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of different arguments that one can use to counteract this. And I just wanna put a few in front of you just to sort of settle this, at least from my perspective, right? People with disabilities are actually the largest minority group there is. Worldwide, there are over a billion people with a disability. And it's actually the one minority group where we all have an opportunity of becoming a member of, whether through accident or illness or just generally old age. 
So this is definitely something that we all want to care about, something that we need to care about, something that we should care about. But why is inclusion important? And why is including disability as important? So I'll kind of dive more into this now that I've hopefully made the case that this is something that I care about and that you should too. So as I said, many problems revolve around humans. So I want to give a little bit of an example of how this, um, how assumptions around what problems there are gets embedded into the technologies that we make. So the question I would ask is who defines the problems? I have a picture here on the slide of one of those ASL translation gloves. Has anyone heard or seen of these, right? Um, this is just one of many, they probably crop up every several years that an engineer has come up with a solution to um, translating ASL. Um, and the problem I think with this technology, um, and, and it's not, a, I mean, it's an interesting idea, right? We're trying to um, address communication barriers between deaf and hearing counterparts, right? But this kind of technology actually gets a lot of criticism from the deaf community. So I just have a brief quote from a director from an ASL program who said, they were surprised and felt somehow betrayed because they obviously didn't check with the deaf community when building this technology. And the main criticism for that is that here we have a technology that's asking the deaf user to wear something on their hands while they sign. The burden is then on that person to be able to create the signs in such a way that the technology can pick up so that they could teach that to the hearing person or so that the hearing person could know what they're saying. The hearing person just has to use that technology and actually doesn't have anything else to do. The other challenge of this and the other criticism is that ASL as a language is so fluid and dynamic that there's almost no way that these technologies could actually work in a way that that translation is conversational or going to work out in a way that someone could carry on that conversation with someone. These technologies, when they demonstrate them, actually do show like one or two, you know, um, signs where there's not a lot of motion, um, like a one word thing, like this one says, I love you, but actually signing is very complicated and varies from person to person. So it's a long way from being a reality for one thing, um, and that can engender a lot of false promises. And for another, it's really embedded in the assumption that whoever takes on the burden of translating or, or making sure the communication happens is the deaf person, but not necessarily the hearing person. So I wanna come back again to this idea that we really need to include people with disabilities in tech because when we think about how that problem was shaped, and if you just read a little bit about deaf community and deaf culture, you would come to that conclusion very quickly that that's probably not gonna work for a deaf person. And probably no deaf person came up with that as a solution. And maybe if we asked the deaf community what might work better, they might come up with something else entirely different. So what should we do? So I wanna come back to this, um, mission statement, because I think it's a really nice, succinct one. Um, and I have a couple of ideas that I've been thinking about. So the first one is that I think we should include people with disabilities as researchers and designers, basically tech professionals. They should be at the sort of upper echelon of tech industry, the ones that make the decisions, who lead the research uh, uh, questions um, and drive all of those teams. The second thing is I think we should equip, equip faculty with tools and resources to be able to teach accessibility to current students, whether they have disabilities or not, to raise awareness of these different kinds of problems, to raise awareness of disability and accessibility as an important part of tech and computing. So just to start with the first one, that we should include people with disabilities as researchers and tech designers, um, I just want to start off with the fact that there's actually a shrinking pipeline of students with disabilities in higher ed in general. So I think technically students with disabilities tend to enter college and university at fairly similar rates as current incidents of disability. But as you go past uh, just entering college, fewer graduate with degrees, fewer enter into post-baccalaureate degree programs, and even fewer even go on to get a PhD. We can drill down deeper into this and look just at people with disabilities in computing and information sciences, and specifically hearing and visual disabilities. So the NSF survey and doctorates in 2017 um, surveyed all of the students who graduated with a PhD in the sciences, and then narrowed down by discipline and by gender and, um, and uh, race and all of these different things to find out like how, how many people are graduating with degrees and, and what their background is. 
So in that year, they reported 0.8% of the computing and information sciences PhDs were awarded to doctorates with a hearing disability, and 3.6% were with, uh, for doctorates with a visual disability. So that's 15 people who identified as having a hearing disability, and 66 who identified as having a visual disability. And that seems pretty low, especially when there were thousands that year. But now I'm going to make it worse. <laughs> because actually, the way the question is asked on the survey is extremely broad. It asks something of a, on the nature of, do you have difficulty with hearing or something like that? And more people would agree with that statement than would identify as being deaf or having or, have, or being hard of hearing. And if you asked all of those people if they identified as a person with a disability or who was deaf, they may not. So that number of of individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing is actually less than 15. And I also come from an institution where they're awarding a lot more of these and I can tell you it's definitely less than 15. Mm. So these numbers are actually inflated and there's so few of them um, that are getting PhDs. So why does this actually happen? Well, there's probably a lot of different reasons, um, but one of the things that we might think about is if we look at the academic institutions from which they're coming from. Our academia is actually built for historically privileged echelons of society. If you have money, if you have a certain status in the community, this is the place for you, right? This is just sort of the history of academia in general. In addition, in the past, research institutions like universities would have research uh, relationships with other quote unquote institutions for people with human subjects, right? So they would actually go to institutions that worked with people with disabilities. Um, to do their research. It's kind of very nefarious activities. And then this idea of success based on merit, which is how we decide whether or not someone graduates with a degree, um, is really embedded into the academic institution. And the idea of what is actually merit is actually embedded within this privileged inclusion in the first place. Another good example um, of the academic institution and accessibility is in this image, which is taken from uh, the front of a building looking down a set of stairs onto a platform and you've got a bunch of people milling around in that space and a few of them are in wheelchairs. And so they were having a tour of this university campus. Um, this is actually a typical uh, architectural uh, idea in university campuses to have stairs leading into the institution of higher learning mm -hmm. to make literally the metaphor of higher learning so that in order to enter that institution, you actually had to go up those stairs. It was actually really commonly included in a lot of college campuses. So actually we've kind of built in some barriers into these uh, spaces that are not accessible. We can actually just bring that into our daily life, right? If we think about the typical classroom experience, um, is that accessible? Is the physical space accessible? Are the materials that we're using accessible? Is the way that we're conveying the information accessible to students? If it's not, does a student with a disability feel welcomed into that space when they haven't been there before? And what happens when they enter it? And then we have to make adjustments at that point. We're in the sciences, so we also have lab spaces. Classrooms aren't the only places. And are the labs also accessible? Is the countertop low enough for a person in a wheelchair? Or is the space um, arranged in such a way that it's safe for a blind person to maneuver and to navigate, to do their titrations or whatever it is they have to do? So these are like general questions that I actually have. And I am definitely interested in higher ed because I want to see um, students with disabilities getting PhDs and becoming those innovators that drive the research questions and ask the questions of different problems than what we're seeing today. So we asked students who are blind, have low vision, or deaf or hard of hearing, who are doctorate students about the challenges they had in their graduate education um, and what they did about accessibility. We interviewed 19 participants, 12 who are blind or low vision, seven who are deaf or hard of hearing. And we just asked them about like, what is your experience like? And what was the quality of those accommodations and how did it work out? We found two main themes. So the first one was access differential, which was defined by the student based on the access that their peers had compared to the access that they had. So there's not a standard way of explaining this. It's not like I can't see the screen and therefore it's not accessible to me. It's, I can't see the screen, but all of my peers use it to do this work and therefore it's not accessible to me. And that differential was defined based on that kind of notion of what your peers are doing and where they're at and where I need to be 
Another aspect of access differential was this confusion between what's difficult and what's accessible in the first place. So an example of this is a quote from B1 who said, are you, uh, Will, are you unable to solve the problem or are you unable to even access what is necessary to solve the problem? I'm sitting here trying to tell my professor I can't access this. He's looking at me like you just don't know how to solve the problem. And this is actually a common occurrence where the student couldn't access something and they went to ask for help and the professor thought they just couldn't do the work. But they actually hadn't even gotten to that point because they hadn't gotten access to the tool or the materials to be able to do the work. And so here there's a conflation of what is actually accessible versus the ability of the student. And oftentimes it leads to this misconception that the student just can't cut it. They're not a grad student, they just can't do it. The other theme that arose from this study was this idea of inequitable access. So once we have this differential, this difference between what students have access to, there's a need to bridge that differential with an accommodation, but not all accommodations are created equal. Um, just because you put something in place doesn't mean it's gonna work well or do the thing that you want it. It could also be uh, more expensive than you have the money for. An example of this was um, about ASL interpreters. D7 said, people will think that accessibility means bringing in ASL interpreters, but at the graduate level, that doesn't always work, especially in STEM. Even if they stay with you all the way, it's still exhausting to do the double translation, and that reduces equal accessibility because you're still needing accommodations. And the idea here is that ASL interpreters don't just interpret ASL, they also have to know about the jargon to be able to know what the sign should be. Um, and there's also the fluidity of the signing. Like I said, every person signs differently. So getting used to the way that they sign makes a difference in how much you understand what they're actually saying. So if you have a different interpreter for this meeting than the one you have for the next meeting, that understanding of jargon doesn't carry over. You have to become familiar with a new interpreter for the next meeting and you lose a lot of information along the way. There's a high cost for all of this. And so just having an interpreter doesn't always solve that problem. So across the board, we saw similar situations like these in all aspects of graduate school. I have here just a diagram with some aspects of graduate school, like going to conferences, managing the advisor relationship, writing papers and doing research, right? These are all grad activities. So we can imagine that for each of these, there's probably an access issue for somebody. And that at each stage of that, that means that they have to try to bridge that access differential in order to be able to do that work in the first place. And if you think about it, it's a small thing maybe just to get an interpreter for a class, but it adds up over time and over activity. And if you think about it, what I did was I squished all of those grad school activities down, but actually they're taking up the same amount of space. So what we've done is we've just added on all the extra tasks, activities, and time that is required to get the, um, the accommodations for those activities. And whose responsibility is it to get those accommodations in place? It's not the advisor's responsibility. It's not even disability services responsibility. It's actually the student's responsibility. In some cases, they won't go to their advisor because they don't wanna admit they can't access something because they're afraid their advisor won't think they can do, will think they can't do it. In some cases, disability services actually does not provide support for graduate students doing research. They must be enrolled in a credit giving course and so they can appeal to disability services and get nothing in return. So oftentimes students will try to find solutions on their own. And if it requires money, then sometimes they'll just pay it out of pocket or they actually will just do without. This actually slows their progress to finishing. And in a lot of cases, it actually prevents them from finishing. So these are some really serious problems that are barriers to students finishing their graduate education that has nothing to do with their ability to actually be a good grad student and do good work. What can we do about it? There's a lot of things, I'll just talk about a few things, right? Is we can help students by being proactive about accommodations. If we know that a student might need some, we can ask them, hey, do you need this, right? We think that it's gonna be awkward to ask someone, um, but actually it's really hard for them to ask every single time. Um, and the other thing is that we can educate faculty and ourselves about what kinds of accommodations might be useful um, and what it means to have access to something and be clear about access versus ability um, and things of that nature. All right. So I'm gonna drop off here a little bit, but I wanna just hang on to this idea about educating faculty um, when I move on to this next stage. But basically at this point, I just wanna um, 
sort of round this out by saying that we really need to reduce the barriers that exist in graduate school for students if we want them to become the tech leaders. And there's so many that are in place. And I really only just scratched the surface of a lot of the things that we found in our research um, about what might be barriers in that space. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here and move on to the second part, um, which is about equipping faculty with tools and resources to increase their capacity to teach accessibility. So this is about faculty broadly, not just advisors for graduate students, um, but just, and also about accessibility, but not necessarily to be accessible in their teaching. So I wanna make that distinction. Okay, so I wanna go back to this problem again about who defines the problems. Actually, the software engineers and the professionals that are out there in tech industry, I mean, we can think of a few of them in our head. <laughs> so some are very famous. Um, and they are the ones that choose the problems, like metaverse, right? This is the stuff we're going to do. This is what we're going to work on, right? Um, and no matter what you think about all of those problems, they had the choice. They got to decide how did they come to that decision and what are they going to do about it? And are they going to incorporate something like accessibility? So we wanted to know more about what professionals are actually doing about accessibility once they get up there. We surveyed and interviewed tech professionals about accessibility, like what do they know about it? Do they use it in the workplace? Um, if they need to know inf any information on the job about how to use it, what are they, what resources are they using? So we got responses from over 50 developers and designers and 10 managers and administrators and just a few who uh, identified as accessibility experts. So actually, hopefully these charts are pretty clear in showing that uh, most of them were not familiar at all um, with um, guidelines like the uh, web accessibility content guidelines or with legal requirements for making uh, things accessible online. And also most of them are not familiar with all with different kinds of disabilities. So in order to be able to make something accessible, you probably need to have an idea of like what it means to have a disability and try to use these technologies and encounter inaccessibility. Probably the scariest thing that we uncovered with this study was the response from everybody that accessibility is someone else's job. Um, most of them said, well, I'm not paid to do that. My job is to write the code to do this thing and to ship this product. Um, someone else is gonna worry about the accessibility later. Um, and if it's not gonna make us money, the other aspect of it is we just wanna keep ourselves clear of legal ramifications, right? Um, and it wasn't that they didn't care about accessibility necessarily. It's just that they weren't paid to do that and time is money. They can't go back to their supervisor and say, I know you told me to build A, but um, actually I really wanted to make it accessible first. So I did that, right? Their boss is gonna be upset if that was not their given task. The other thing is that um, they didn't have any resources to be able to find out about this, right? There was no education for them. They weren't taught anything about it in school before they got to the job. Even if they thought it was a good idea, they had no way to implement it. And they also were told to do something else entirely so they couldn't spend time on it even if they wanted to. Um, a lot of other reasons were included for not having accessibility in their process. A couple of them um, also include the leadership of the company and whether that translated into it being an important value of the company. So maybe I'd be willing to spend some of my time on it if I knew the company in general was really on board with this. And the other thing is that their process and development cycles didn't account for accessibility in it. So they might have a schedule and a plan and a timeline. Here's our deadline. This is when it needs to ship. And nowhere in that timeline would it say, check for accessibility. The sad thing though, is when we asked them about whether or not they encountered accessibility in their formal education, most of them actually said they had it. So that was like sad beans for us. Um, and that's a problem. So who is actually teaching accessibility? We conducted a survey um, of computer science faculty in 318 institutions. We got over 1800 responses um, from faculty about if they teach accessibility in their computing courses. Surprise, only 2.5% of them actually do. Also, not surprisingly, most of them were in HCI. Yay, us. <laughs> um, but for the vast majority of the rest of them in all other areas of computing, they actually were not including accessibility. The other thing about it is that um, we wanted to know a little bit about what people are teaching. So it's good that we have some, it'd be better if we had more teaching accessibility, um, but it's also important to know that they're teaching 
something about it more than just that it's there. Um, so we did a literature review survey to find out where people are studying this and how that's being covered across the board. Um, most accessibility is being taught in HCI and front end development courses, which kind of makes sense. But after that, there's a drop off and there is not a lot of mention about accessibility in other tech courses, even though clearly when you think about things like screen readers, there's a lot that goes behind the scenes in software engineering accessibility into these tools. So more could actually be done to include accessibility knowledge into technical courses. One, it's a good tool for learning how to code something that is a screen reader and can say things. Um, and another thing is that it raises awareness of the fact that these technologies actually exist and that people actually use them. So when we're thinking about needing to include accessibility in computing education, really we're coming around to this idea that not very many of us are actually teaching it in the first place. So we need to raise awareness about teaching accessibility as part of computing. Um, and we also need to um, increase this awareness for the classrooms themselves to produce professionals that are including this in their work and in their daily life. All right. So all of this leads me to a little bit of kind of like, what am I actually doing now with some of this stuff? Okay. So the first one I wanna focus on is this need to include people with disabilities in tech. So one project that I'm really thinking about is this idea of think, uh, the Think Aloud protocol with deaf and hard of hearing users. Um, so on the right here on the screen is just a couple of uh, screenshots of um, a podcast design um, by one of my students who was working on a capstone project. And she was designing um, podcasts for deaf users. So deaf users also like to uh, hear, use podcasts, but uh, podcasts are uh, notoriously not accessible to them because it's an audio resource um, and not all of them are captioned and not all of them have transcripts. So she did some research work to find out what their interests were in podcasts and then she um, in, in, um, did a little bit of a design to figure out like what would be the ideal way that they would want to see their transcripts or their uh, captions in a podcast. In doing this work, she um, did usability testing and usability studies with deaf and hard of hearing users to find out how they liked the designs that she created. So this is very typical, like human-centered design strategy. And she applied the Think Aloud protocol. So I think most of us might be familiar with it, but the idea of Think Aloud is that you have a user who's testing a user interface and they're probably clicking on something or tapping through something. And as they're doing that, they're saying to you, okay, I'm gonna click on this thing and hopefully it'll take me to the search results and then I'll see what I want and I'm looking for what I want and I don't see it, so I'm gonna click here, right? So there's this sort of in the moment um, uh, discussion or saying about what, what they're seeing and what they're doing and, and what they're kind of like deciding at that period of time. For a deaf person, especially an ASL um, speaker, it's actually a bit harder um, because you can't actually sign and tap at the same time. Um, so what this uh, student did was she had her participants sign to her what they were going to be doing and then do that task and then sign the next thing and then do that task. Um, so that kind of works, except one of the main sort of takeaways from Think Aloud is this, this concept of in the moment. So if they signed something and then tried to do the task and then encountered something they weren't expecting, does that get captured in the next iteration of the sign that they do for the next step? Um, what happens in that case, right? We don't actually really know. She applied the sign and then do um, strategy. Another thing that she did in her project was she had captured the languages that the participants used on a daily basis. Um, so there's actually a broad range of them. Uh, SimCom is like a simulation communication with signing and CSEE -E is signed exact English. Um, if you're familiar with ASL, it has a grammar all its own. So signing a sentence um, is not the same as the English of it in terms of like the ordering of the words and the verbs and things like that. But signed exact English is like signing the words as you're saying it. So in ASL, it looks really weird. Um, but if you're a hearing person, then you, uh, you can kind of catch what they're saying or if you can hear a little bit. Um, so she captured the languages they use daily, but then she also documented their preferred communication, particularly in the study and what they wanted to do. So I thought about this problem a little bit, given that we'd want, we weren't able to get that elicitation in the moment. Um, and we got a Google Scholar Award to be able to look more deeply into this problem. 
Um, and I have do, uh, two deaf students who are now working on this project um, to try to figure out like what would be a better way to do this elicitation rather than asking them to think aloud if you have ASL signers who aren't really gonna be talking at the same time. So the next thing that I've been working on is having to do with accessibility and computing education. So we talked a lot about um, the fact that not a lot of people are teaching um, accessibility and computing and that those who are teaching it are primarily focused in HCI or front end design. So a few colleagues and I have a project where we are embedding accessibility modules within uh, CS1, CS2 database courses, introductory computer science courses um, that we can give to instructors so they don't have to have a huge, um, uh, they don't have to have a lot of knowledge about accessibility. Um, but we can give them some materials, including an assignment, to give to their students in just one part of a larger course on like disability, uh, sorry, data structures, um, to infuse a little bit of accessibility into that course. Um, and we're measuring outcomes about student learning based on having these modules in the courses. And then we're also getting data from the instructors themselves to find out how useful are the materials, how are the students learning the core material, um, for example, the data structure that they're trying to learn um, and making sure that all of those things are still in place while also raising awareness about accessibility. So one of the assignments we have is like having students translate Braille into English instead of maybe what usually is ASCII into English, right? And so just making these small tweaks um, and adding in this layer of, yes, Braille can be digitally translated. There's refreshable Braille tools that are being used um, and just kind of embedding some of that knowledge in, in this tech world. So just to come back to that main question of like, who are software engineers and designers and who are the people that we're thinking about when we think of them? And I just want to hopefully motivate you to think that maybe they also are people with disabilities, even though we might not be thinking about that all the time and we may not know a lot of them currently, but we will soon. Um, so yeah, hopefully I've motivated you just a little bit to kind of shift a little bit and think more broadly about who software engineers and designers who tech professionals actually are um, and what they can be doing and include people with disabilities in that mindset. And then just like totally a shameless plug. So <laughs> if you wanna include accessibility in computing courses, we definitely wanna work with you. Um, so please um, check, out, check us out or just out, send me an email. And if you have advised a disabled grad student or you are a graduate student with, dis with a disability, we'd love to talk to you as well. Um, so just, you know, let me know. And of course, all of this work doesn't happen by itself. There's billions of people, okay, not billions. There's a lot of people who have helped um, and I probably am not even getting them all on the slide, but I tried my best. Um, and so I just wanna give them credit for all the work in this uh, in all of this work and then say, thank you very much for your time. And I'm happy to take questions. Oh, no. Yes. Hi, Kristen. Thank you for a great talk, as always. Um, I am super interested in the representation for all the obvious reasons you can imagine of our disabled students in graduate school. And I can tell you nationally, and, and especially here in the UC, the numbers are going way up. Oh, good. Um, yes. It's almost all invisible disabilities. So we'll yeah. put that in its own category. But I'm curious what you think if we've gotten better in higher ed and including folks, and that's what's happening, if people have gotten more comfortable with admitting to and disclosing disabilities, or if there's some mix of things going on, or, or we have more disabled people, what you think is happening? That is a really good question. I feel like I'm not qualified to answer. Um, I mean, I think it's probably a little bit of a lot of things. I think there's definitely broader awareness, because you've had things like the Disability Visibility Project and, and all of those advocacy groups. Um, and then, yeah, I do think there's a lot of more heightened awareness about what disability means and what it is, and more folks willing to say, yeah, that's me, and this is something that I want to be a part of. Um, but I don't know. And I, I actually, you know, I think it's still really hard. Like, um, We've graduated PhD students with, who are deaf or hard of hearing at RIT, and they're like such a minority. And we know all of them probably. I think we know all of the deaf PhDs that there are, right? And that's, that's I mean, that's kind of cool, but also it's, it's kind of sad, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thank 
for the talk, and it was really impressive just to see the spread of your work from like the kind of diagnostic work of identifying the problem all the way to especially the step at the end of like doing that hard work of figuring out the legislative practice and the policy stuff to do to get that. Um, like, I, it's just really hard work. And the range is such a like, oh, thank you. signal appreciation. But I, my question is, so like I find that it's often, there's often a really big gap between like understanding the problem and like trying out something innovative and then actually getting it to take hold in practice. Um, and institutionalizing it because it feels like where you are in your work. And I just want to hear sort of how it's going. I mean, it's, a, it's like a great strategy, right? Because our, like, I also do like, you know, the social cultural stuff and, you know, you want people to take um, ethics for engineers or whatever, but we get siloed into these little specialized courses mm -hmm. like gender and technology, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're trying to like, modularize it, but you also have to convince people who are not specialists to take it up. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious how that's been going. Yeah, that's a great, we had this conversation at lunch. That's a great question. So it's just um, about uh, maybe what we would do to institutionalize this, uh, some of this work. And uh, I feel like that's a 10 years thing to think about. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not really sure how, but I mean, like, uh, so a couple of things. And one of the things we talked about at lunch was at RIT, we have um, a pretty large deaf and hard of hearing student population. We're co-located with the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. So we have a lot of, a lot of students on campus who use ASL interpreters or captioning and, and that sort of thing. Um, where was I going with what I was saying? Um, so uh, I totally just lost my transfer. We were institutes. Oh yeah. So you would think that in um, our HCI master's program, we talk about accessibility a lot. Um, and we kind of do, but we don't actually have a specific core HCI course that is only accessibility in it. All of the faculty are really passionate about accessibility. So we've just been infusing it into the way that we teach things. We want all of our assignments from the students to be accessible. We try to make our materials accessible. We talk about it as the nature of the way HCI work is is done or just in that context. Um, and so that was kind of like how we decided to do the teaching module one with the, the compute, computer science instructors. Um, and the reason for that is because if you do create a course that's like accessibility in computing, students will, and if, if, it's, if it's an elective course, students will self-select into that course or out of it. And as we've seen with the um, software engineers and the software developers that we surveyed and interviewed the tech professionals, they already, they self-select themselves out. That's someone else's job. Mm -hmm. So if we don't catch that before they um, graduate, then they will always continue to think that way. And so one way to kind of counteract that is to look at it both as an elective and also as something you include in the in required courses, like what you're already doing, how do you put that into the courses that, that they're taking already? Um, I think it requ requiring a course like that is a whole other ball of wax. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is the institutionalization part of it. I think that's also tricky. I mean, um, the, at the other end of it, we are recruiting instructors to use these modules. Um, and it's really hard because a lot of computing faculty, you know, are like, well, you know, I'm teaching algorithms and there's really nothing here for me to do, right? Um, and that's not necessarily true, but convincing them that maybe this is worth a try is kind of a challenge. And um, you know, something that we're we're working on in our outreach and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a next step problem. So if anyone has suggestions, we'll take them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so I, I come from the industry back uh, PhD. Uh, so you were saying that you're a software professional to us basically, but I can tell we absolutely do not think about accessibility what <laughs> in the applications we build, apart from one app where the senior stakeholder is colorblind. That makes, that makes yeah, that happens, yeah. Um, but I'm just curious because um, if I look at like, uh, the remit you chose about um, people with disabilities in grad school, you know, the number of shrink things that got higher up the pyramid, um, it kind of reminds me a bit of like the women in tech problem, um, where you know you get more women into computer science courses, so then you've got more people going into the workplace. Uh, but I guess studies on, on women in tech, and it's a case study, has shown that you know, the numbers are growing at universities, but then actually women are still dropping out of the workplace. 
they drop out workplace when they're 26, 27 into toxic environments. Mm -hmm. They subsequently drop out in their 30s when they have kids. Um, you know, there's been this kind of main um, uh, child care. Uh, so I was kind of curious that, you know, if you kind of attack the problem at the academic level, like, that's great, but what about in the industry level? Because we're actually making workplaces more accessible for people with disabilities. It kind of, I suspect, has similar challenges to the, you know, women in tech. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and definitely there's so many parallels with women in computing. I, I, I think the numbers are pretty much the same as they were when I was an undergrad, which is sad. Um, but I, I get questions about this a lot because on the one hand, sometimes people think, well, industry will be better because they have to legally accommodate me and therefore that's not going to be an issue. Right. But on the other hand, you're right that I think attitudes are tracing along that trajectory that they get from undergrad. Um, and I think, you know, I've done a little, I've had a little bit of conversations with folks in industry who um, are like accessibility evangelists. Um, so there's there are little pockets of that. Um, but I think it's yeah, an understudied area and definitely um, could use a lot more um, uh, attention. I mean, I think the the best example that I've seen of it is with Microsoft because they actually have someone in the C-suite whose focus is accessibility. And then in the last year with all the tech layoffs, I think we lost a lot of people in tech who were focused on it. So it's like an uphill battle where you have like two steps forward, two steps back, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't really have an answer to that other than what I just said, <laughs> which is probably not that satisfying. I'm sorry to say. Question about your work on inequitable access and access differential. So, um, I think we see inequitable access all the time, right? So that's about, all, you know, accommodations are not all created equal. But I was wondering about the access differential concept, and um, you know, in some ways, it it anchors access to um, non-disabled people. And so, have you mm -hmm. run into any problems with that kind of framing for it and that it's still positioning disability as a deficit with able-bodied norms as the standard to which we must then accommodate. Oh, that's Does a that really, yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I hadn't thought of it that way because the, um, that uh, theme or category, however you want to call it, actually came from the data itself. Like that's the way students described the accessibility challenges that they were encountering. And I think more that had more to do with graduate school culture than like society and measuring yourself against non-disabled folks um, because they're looking at what do I have to produce to be successful as a grad student? And it's like such a, a very hard time of just trying to get things going and trying to get things moving and um, having to navigate actually a lot of the social relationships that are intertwined with these requests and accommodations and dealing with accessibility, um, that that's how they um, determined like what they needed to do. And I think this is actually common in graduate school. It's like how we decide whether or not we're doing well enough is by seeing where our peers are in grad school anyway, right? And um, whether or not that's the right way to do it, right? My, 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 the students in my lab are all writing papers. We're all contributing and submitting to Kai this year or something like that. Um, and that's how we decide whether or not we're, we're in that clan, in that group, right? So if you're a student with a disability and you're having to drop that paper because you didn't have access to something, a tool to allow you to do the analysis, then that's how that feels to you is that I'm not submitting because of access, not because I couldn't do the analysis. So I think that's how they were describing it. Um, so definitely, I think that whole perspective on this ableist aspect of it, in terms of measuring by non-disabled uh, standards, is a really good criticism of that, yeah. But I, I don't know, like, I mean, I think that just sort of says a lot about the framing of grad school, probably, mm -hmm. yeah, and the, the institution, yeah. Yeah, sounds great. <laughs> I don't know if there are online questions, but I don't think so. We can probably take one more question. Um, so I want to sort of follow up a little bit on exactly what you were just saying, because I was being put in mind of a situation a few years ago where I was on this um, committee trying to sort of address uh, 
The problem that students were reporting that they felt that their programs were not accepting of non-academic career outcomes, right? Wanting to leave the academy. And as we started to look at it, it turned out much of the pressure was not coming from professors or from teachers or advisors. It's coming from other students who are themselves committed to the idea that that was their goal, and therefore bringing a lot of pressure to us. And so many of your examples sort of that focus on sort of institutional change are sort of pointing at, I guess, sort of like regulators at like the higher levels of the institution and indeed at professors and needing to sort of be more accommodating of uh, students with disabilities. But it strikes me that this is actually more of a cultural question. And so the question is, what kind of tools do we have to sort of broadly change the culture, which actually includes other students who may have very mm -hmm. normalizing kinds of ideas about what drives their life? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. And when, that's one of the things that we heard a lot about from students themselves in another study that I didn't talk about, which was that they, when we asked them about learning accessibility in computing or computer science, they were saying things like, well, but the tech industry doesn't care about it. So I don't need to care about it. And this is a more broad cultural issue that they perceived it as not being important because tech didn't consider that a priority. And so that kind of like filtered down to where they were seeing those tech uh, professionals and what they aspire to be and being like well that's not part of that story and therefore it's not part of mine so I think that's definitely a, a cultural thing a societal thing it's bigger than what we are but there's a lot of that that's that is still embedded in the institution and how we do things in academia um, that I think carried over into the way the students were talking about it in that study anyway yeah but that's a really great point I agree yeah all right and with that, um, that concludes our informatics seminar for today and for uh, this year for the spring quarter.